Thank you, Roxana, for that wonderful introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, the mother of all the contests, the contests you've been waiting for. Here we go. Club, area, division, district officials, fellow Toastmasters, welcome guests, children. Good evening to you all. Are you ready? Yes. This is the moment. Welcome to the Division E District 20 International Speaking Contest. We're going to have an enriching, enlightening, and entertaining session, believe me. Each year, over 30,000 participants from 116 countries enter the International Speech Contest. Competitions begin at the club, to area, and to the division and to this district. At the inter-district level, 82 contestants battle it out in nine simultaneous contests, and nine finalists finally enter the International Speaking Championship. This year, it's going to be held in Orlando, Florida. The contestants from here could make it up to the International Speech Contest and could win and be the World Champion of Public Speaking 2012. Ladies and gentlemen, please give the contestants a big round of applause. We press for time, so we quickly move on to the contest. Eligibility and originality certificates were signed by the contestants. Timing. We'll check the timing device once again. Green at 5 minutes. Amber at 6. 7 will be the red. There will be no warning after the red line if the, if the speaker continues to speak. We have several mobile players assisting us with this contest. There are timers, tally counters, sergeant dams, and judges. And we also have a chief judge, the Swedish Toastmaster, Amai Furry, and his team. Please give them all a big round of applause. There are eight contestants. This evening, I will call the speaking order. Judges, please note. Speaker number one, Navin Cameron. Navin Cameron. Speaker number two, Justin Drymon. Justin Drymon. Speaker number three, Singa Raju. Speaker number three. Singa Raju. Speaker number four. Nisha Shivaram. Speaker number five. Manish Shah. Speaker number five. Manish Shah. Speaker number six. Maria Irish Ramos. Speaker number five, Maria Irish Ramos. I beg your pardon, six. Moving on to speaker number seven, Sunil K.S. Speaker number eight, Philip Cherian. Ladies and gentlemen, please give them a big round of applause. We'd like to welcome Her Excellency, Indian Ambassador to Qatar. Please give her a big round of applause.
gentlemen, please be seated. Speaker number one, Naveen Khan, cling to hope, cling to hope, Naveen Khan. Mother can give. 
God's gift to Kareem is limitless beyond words. He is now a very cute and sociable boy in grade one that all people would fall in love with at first sight. If I had learned anything from this extraordinary experience with my son Kareem, it's the importance of faith and hope. Such unique experiences bring you nearer to God and humanity. It teaches you that yes, it could happen to you. It teaches you that no matter the ordeal is, be sure it is happening for a reason that only God knows about. And no matter how much you cry on your side, this will not change your destiny. So your only chance to survive is to tenaciously cling to the frail thread of hope. Because this is your only route to acceptance and eventually happiness. And be wary. If you are not happy from inside, you will not be happy from outside. And if you are not happy with what you have today in your hands, you will not be happy for the rest of your life. And be sure, the sun is still there over there somewhere beyond the clouds. You just need to be patient and trust it will rise again for you. And until that day happens, remember, anyone can give up. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. But to hold it together, when everyone around you would understand, if you fall apart, that's true strength. Back to your conscious strength. Speaker number two, Justin Dreyman. The world needs teachers. The world needs teachers. Justin Dreyman. A mediocre teacher tells. A good teacher explains. A superior teacher demonstrates. But a great teacher inspires. Dear Contest Chair, Pile of Judges, fellow Postmasters, Cavaliers, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening. Yes, a great teacher inspires. He is the candle that lights hundreds of other candles. But very recently I happened to enter into a mini debate with some of my colleagues at school. It started with this teacher who was saying that she discourages her children from becoming teachers. Soon other teachers joined the phrase saying that they too discourage their students from becoming teachers. But most common opinion of most teachers was that teaching jobs got us peanuts and that there is no respect for people in this profession anymore. They felt that these days only those who fail in other jobs end up teaching. That is, those who can do, those who can't teach. Those who can do, those who can't teach. This set me into thinking for several days. Was teaching no more a noble profession? Do teachers have no more charisma? Do teachers no more believe in their power? The power of the spark? The power of touching tender lives? The power of making a difference? If I ask you, Thank you, Roxana, for that wonderful introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, the mother of all the contests, the contests you've been waiting for. Here we go. Club, area, division, district officials, fellow postmasters, welcome guests, children. Good evening to you all.
gentlemen, please be seated. Speaker number one, Naveen Khan, cling to hope, cling to hope, Naveen Khan. Mother can give. 
God's gift to Karim is limitless beyond words. He is now a very cute and sociable boy in grade one that all people would fall in love with at first sight. If I had learned anything from this extraordinary experience with my son Karim, it's the importance of faith and hope. Such unique experiences bring you nearer to God and humanity. It teaches you that yes, it could happen to you. It teaches you that no matter the ordeal is, be sure it is happening for a reason that only God knows about. And no matter how much you cry on your side, this will not change your destiny. So your only chance to survive is to tenaciously cling to the frail thread of hope because this is your only route to acceptance and eventually happiness. And beware, if you are not happy from inside, you will not be happy from outside. And if you are not happy with what you have today in your hands, you will not be happy for the rest of your life. And be sure, the sun is still there over there somewhere beyond the clouds. You just need to be patient and trust it will rise again for you. And until that day happens, remember, anyone can give up. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. But to hold it together, when everyone around you would understand if you fall apart, that's true strength. Back to your comments, Jeff. Speaker number two, Justin Dreiner. The world needs teachers. The world needs teachers. Justin Dreiner. A mediocre teacher tells. A good teacher explains. A superior teacher demonstrates. But a great teacher inspires. Dear Contest Chair, panel of judges, fellow postmasters, cavaliers, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening. Good evening. Yes, a great teacher inspires. He is the candle that lights hundreds of other candles. But very recently I happened to enter into a mini debate with some of my colleagues at school. It started with this teacher who was saying that she discourages her children from becoming teachers. Soon other teachers joined the phrase saying that they too discourage their students from becoming teachers. The most common opinion of most teachers was that teaching jobs got us peanuts and that there is no respect for people in this profession anymore. They felt that these days only those who fail in other jobs end up teaching. That is, those who can do, those who can't teach. Those who can do, those who can't teach. This set me into thinking for several days. Was teaching no more a noble profession? Do teachers have no more charisma? Do teachers no more believe in their power? The power of the spark? The power of touching tender lives? The power of making a difference? If I ask you, who have school going children, as to what you would want your children to become, I'm sure most of you would say that you want your son or daughter to become an engineer, a doctor, a CEO, a scientist and so on and so forth. And maybe not one would give teaching a thought. When I asked my great tenters as to what they wanted to become, teaching, they said, would be their last option. Teaching, their last option. Can you imagine the consequence of such apathy towards this profession? 
The teaching fraternity would soon be a world of dejected people, oblivious of the pastoral care and the greater role that we teachers play in defining the society. If the world is in any way a bad world today, it's because we teachers have failed in delivering our goods. My eight-year-old son sometimes says that his, father, his friend's fathers are all engineers and often questions me like, Daddy, why didn't you study hard in school and become an engineer so that you could have earned a lot of money and bought me a PSB or Xbox as all my friends have? I told him, Son, it was not because that I did not study hard that I have become a teacher. In fact, I was one of the school toppers in the board exam. But it was my deliberate choice to become a teacher. Well, to convince an eight world that money is not the most important of life's need was difficult. I simply told him that if there weren't the teachers, who would then make and teach these children to become future doctors, engineers and teachers? I explained and thus regained some lost credibility in my son's eyes. Has this noble profession lost its credibility in your eyes? Just spend a moment in reflection, dear friends. All you successful people out there, and you will be able to see before your eyes the image of at least one great teacher who has inspired you to become what you are today. Teaching is a very challenging job, but its rewards are innumerable. As teachers, we get the incredible joy of seeing the difference that we make in our students. Every day we are molding the future by impacting on our students' views and understanding. We are fostering creativity, developing character, and giving them lenses with which to view the world. An eternal bond, a lifelong bond is created between us. A bond of friendship, a bond of values, a bond of uh, gratitude. We are the communication link that powers change. Another important factor that keeps us going is that teaching stimulates an opportunity for laughter. And being in the midst of children who at the slightest of opportunity burst into laughter. And laughter being so contagious, there is never a day of teaching where a teacher like me would not be laughing a couple of times. Well, the world needs teachers. Yes, the world does need quality teachers. Teachers who can inspire and love for learning rather than dictate norms and give facts. In these days of information technology, one would easily argue that a teacher's role is becoming redundant. A single click of the mouse on, say, Google search would get more information than all the teachers, teachers in a school could possibly provide. That with all the online tutoring, distance education programs, a teacher is no more needed. But let me ask you, friends, could a computer teaching a child how to form the curves of the letter A be able to put a reassuring hand on the child's shoulder while holding that hand firmly with the other to show how it must be done? Or an inanimate object like computer instill in the youth the humane qualities? The answer is, of course, no, dear friends. The teacher is here to stay. His influence is limitless. And if I sound like a brand ambassador of this product called teachers, well then, I am one. The world does need quality teachers. Thank you. We'll have one minute of silence for the judges. Sing the Raju. Dash between the dates. 
dash between the dates. Singa Raja. Master, fellow Toastmasters, distinguished guests, honorable judges. Good evening. Good evening. In our life, we make a series of dashes, be it to shopping, office, meeting, airport. But the dash I'm talking about today is from the time we were born to the time we actually leave this world. If you see over here, the small dash between the legs, that's the one I'm talking about. It doesn't matter how much cash, cars, or comforts we have. What really matters is how we live and love to make the dash count in our life. During my childhood days, I wanted to become someone famous, but did not know how. So I started reading books of history. When I learned that great leaders such as Mahatma Gandhi and Abraham Lincoln took a lifetime to achieve the fame, I changed my mind. If fame can come only after death, I'm not in hurry. I decided to study hard, but unfortunately, my teachers Work still harder to expose my ignorance. They had this wonderful tools called examinations. As time passed, I used the rule of dash. And by using it, I transformed from being a dumber to a dasher. Let me explain that to you. The letter D in dash stands for drive. I once asked my coach, how can I be more successful in life? He said, let's go into the swimming pool. As we entered the pool, something strange happened. In one motion, he dug my head in the water and took me out just in time. He asked me, what were you thinking when your head was in the water? Thinking? I was gasping for breath. As badly as you wanted to breathe, such should be your drive to be successful in life. No matter what, you eat with it, you live with it, and you drink with it. You must not rest till you succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to ask ourselves, do we show the drive in whatever we do? A in dash stands for action. Just as a sculptor tirelessly with his chisel and mallet works on a stone, Till he achieves that beautiful statue. So also, for every action of ours, we need to ask ourselves, is this adding quality to my life or taking away something from it? If you think that teaching your children nursery rhymes is going to improve your quality, go ahead and do it, no problem. S in dash stands for spirit. It was during June 1981, this newspaper headlines caught my attention. One person single-handedly united an entire nation. This was an 18-year-old boy who was diagnosed with bone cancer. He had to have his leg amputated. When he was in the clinic, he was rudely awakened by the despair and many faces which have forgotten how to smile. He said, I need to do something. He went to many places for donations, 
nothing came. He took a strong decision. I am going to run from coast to coast. Boy, did he run? He ran 40 kilometers every day, covered a distance of 5,273 kilometers. The only thing which could stop the spirit and run was when the deadly disease engulfed him. He is not known as someone who has been befallen by misfortune. But crime of human spirit against insurmountable odds. Whenever things don't go my way, I think about Derek Fox. When he can do it, why not I? I'm back to my normal spirits. H in dash stands for heart. Imagine if each one of us had a watch which showed the time we have left to live in this world. What would happen? Various ideas come, places we have not visited, words of gratitude we have not spoken, quality time not spent with near and dear. If we follow our heart and live each day as though today is the last day of our life, we will not have any regrets. Ladies and gentlemen, let me confess to you, I have been a college dropout and just by following the route of dash, I managed to secure 16th rank in Chartered Accountancy Examination. If someone with an ordinary mind like mine can do it, I'm sure that you, you and you can achieve greater heights if you follow the rule of dash. Remember, increase your drive. Take action which has quality. Keep up your spirit at all times and follow your heart. If you do it, you can boldly stand up and say, I will be remembered for time memorial. Since I made it count, the dash between the dates. Mr. Pontus. Nisha Shimran. Beware, he is after you. Beware, he is after you. Nisha Shimran. But things have to change. 
But she had always been the undisputed heroine for all college plays. So it was very natural that she thought she was the buff competition for the lead role when she auditioned for the intercollegiate drama contest. And I watched her as a constant confidant and Munchie blissfully unaware of the fact that I was actually one of the competitors in the drama auditions. And trust me, I hid this from her just to have some fun and to surprise her. But surprises of surprises, I was chosen for the lead role. And what a rude, agonizing shock that was for Munchie that she rushed into her room like a tornado, slamming the door shut on my face refusing even to talk to me and clear her misunderstandings. I cried profusely. Who is she, Nisha? Munchies like her will come and go. Do not shed a tear for her. Now let her come and say sorry to you first. My possessive lover instigated a painful detachment. And he was right. Who was she? After all, I was the lead actor of a college play and was in no mood to enact a reconciliation. So, the dialogues between us stopped and we became total strangers in no time. But at times, my heart whispered, Go Nisha, say sorry to your friend. But louder were the words of my lover than the whisper that without a smile, a handshake, or chocolates, Munchie and I parted for good. But things had to change. My life, my career, my relations. But not the possessiveness of my lover who compelled me to live in a selfish, self-centered world. At times I long to reunite with my long-lost friends. And when Nagpur beckoned me with a college reunion after 15 years, my joy knew no bounds. But then, why did I carry a box of munch chocolates? My eager eyes sought for Munchie's face in the crowd, and my heart ached, not seeing her anywhere. That pain grew unbearable when I learned that Munchie has been with her parents for the last nine years, deserted by her husband. A victim of domestic violence and physical abuse, a mental wreck, she was living a devastated life. God was so unkind to have scripted such a role for her. And falling to the charms of my lover, I have been playing a sinfully selfish role all this while. And being human, chances are that we all fall to the evil charms of my lover. Rather, our common lover. Yes, we all have a common lover and that is our ego. Our ego always plays a villainous role, bringing down the curtains of many beautiful relations and friendships. I was off to meet Munchie and say a thousand sorries for deserting her during the stages of agony. But time waits for none. My dear friend tragically passed away a few weeks ago. Dear friends, if we prevail over our despicable ego, many such forgotten munchies shall come into view awaiting a smile, a phone call, or a simple message from us. Meet a friend, a colleague, or maybe someone in this room. If we can deprive our ego of its writing rights, we shall perhaps rescript someone's life to a happy end. And as you ponder over it, let me leave you with this small poem. I built you up and you tore me down. I gave you my best, yet you demanded more. Why are you still here? There is nothing left to give you. My ego, let me die in peace. Make some way and please.
मनीष शाह This most of you who say is just a negative film. Why? Some of you may see an outdated photographic technology in this. But how many of you thought about the possibility of generating unlimited positive thoughts from this single photo negative? It's no surprise if no one thought so, because we often give in. To the apparent, limiting ourselves not to go beyond. Mr. Contest Chair, fellow Toastmasters, and dear guests, good evening. Life is a fusion of negatives and positives. By nature, we all know how to take in the positives, but presented with negatives, many of us would give in to its screams. In flashback, had I given in to one such negative instance 30 years back, I wouldn't be addressing you all this evening. It was a bright sunny morning of 4th May 1982. I was playing near the well, which was about 100 yards away from my uncle's house. There was a carpenter busy polishing his wooden furniture. A group of young boys were having fun there. Out of nowhere, a boy from the group threw a lighted matchstick towards the carpenter. It accidentally fell into a can of varnish. And varnish being highly flammable, it immediately turned into huge fireball. Therefore, the boy, by the unexpected situation, quickly kicked that kid away to save himself. But as fate would have it, that can landed right on my back. I was ablaze in no time. In panic, I ran toward my uncle's house. A gentleman with great presence of mind and courage stopped me and tried to put out the fire. After 24 utter unconscious hours, I woke up, find myself on a hospital, lying in my stomach with a stomach churning smell of burnt flesh and medicament for company. My back was severe burns and I felt acute pain as if someone has peeled off my skin with a knife. Under the sedation, I overheard Dr. Spitzman that I had third degree one and chances of survival was only 10 percent. Time stood still. Life came to a grinding halt. Fearful and tearful sins to my mind. Was it the end? Was it the end? No. There was this pride beacon of hope. My mother. When most of the hospitals refused to admit me to severity of wounds, it was my mother's persistence, patience, and presence of mind which brought me to this hospital in time. I could see through my very eyes that she was holding on that 10 percent chances of my survival with total conviction. I could see the comforting power of hope and strong determination in her heart. This strong positive conviction continually fed me with hope and courage and your the pain. Though I remained a helpless invalid, depending on my mother for all my primary needs. After six torturous months and 
several follow-up surgeries. My mother resurrected me to my second life. This was nothing less than a miracle, but my mother proved that even death dreads to confront a determined mother. Dear friends, on one hand, this tragic accident gave me severe pain, agony, and scars to live with. But on the flip side, it taught me valuable positive lesson. With hope and strong determination, things can turn around. Sometimes in life, you are struck hard, things turn upside down, unthinkable happen. What do we do? Cry foul? Blame others? Blame circumstances? Or fight it out with the courage? The choice lies with you. Either give in to the negatives or strive for positive. <laughs> Fellow Toastmasters and dear friends, it takes both rain and sunshine to create rainbow. And our lives are no different. There are negatives and positives, the bad and the good, the sorrow and the joy. We cannot control all that happens in our life. But we definitely have control on how we react to them and what we learn from them. Like a photo negative, every negative of our life has a potential to develop positives. We just need to strive for it. As this old African proverb says, the sun will shine first on those who stand before it shines on those who lean under it. Over to you. Frustrations and resentment. 
Then it came to a point that I decided to quit my job. My boss suggested that I go on vacation to see if I would have a change of heart. So I went back home to the Philippines. But even so, I was still feeling stressed and unhappy. <clears throat> even my friends noticed that I was not in my usual bubbly face, so, so they, to cheer me up, they decided to start planning about hiking in Mount Palaypalay. I was not really up for it because I don't, just don't feel like going at that time. They said that I used to be the one who has the passion for thrill and adventure. Well, in fact, I was the one who convinced them to go bungee jumping before. I can't simply explain it, but adventures gives me this burst of energy and fulfillment. And looking at Mount Palaypalay, how powerful it stands with the misty clouds surrounding it, I always wondered what it would feel like to stand on its peak. So although I was not in my best spirit, I went along with my friends for my very first time. We made our way through the thick forested areas and luscious grasslands. And after the first 20 minutes, my lungs felt like they were going to explode. It was hours after hours of an uphill trek pushing my body to utter exhaustion. At last, we have reached the final song of the summer. But as I climb up, my arms and my legs were giving up on me. I kept on telling myself that I am here to reach the top. So I gathered all of my strength and with all my might put myself for final try and made it. Conquer the summit in a sense of freedom and power. I realized that I can achieve my goal if I do it with passion. That passion felt like a fire burning within me. It brought up my commitment and determination to go for what I want to achieve. Passion was the extra push that I needed to overcome that challenging moment. And then I thought, if I can get through that summit through my passion, then why not do the same for my job? So I decided to pursue my current career and travel back to Doha. But this time, I made sure that I faced each day with the same passion when I reached for the summit. I rekindled my passion for work, which made it much easier to complete any task. Over time, everyone noticed a positive change in me. I'm back to my optimistic state, and from then on, I never looked back. I was able to sell more and do more for my company, and that reaffirmed my belief that I can actually achieve my goal if I do it with passion. But then one evening, I received a very distressed call from my mother. Apparently, my brother had been skipping classes and seems to have lost his interest to earn his degree. I reached out to him, helping him realize how important education is. I shared my recent job at work and how I overcome it. I helped him reignite his passion for sports because I remember him always telling me how he wanted to be a varsity player. So I pushed for him to do that. A certain academic mark is required to maintain, to be in the varsity team, so passion has become his driving force to become a good basketball player and a good student. So if any of you here find yourself <coughs> bored in your life or seems to have lost your interest in your job, just take some time off. Go out there and do whatever it is that you're most passionate about. Because once you reignite that passion, that fire burning within you, no amount of challenge can hold you back from achieving your success. Share that passion with the people around you 
and you'll be amazed on what you can do. So keep that fire burning within you. Over to the conscious chair. Speaker number seven, Sunil K. S. Title, Bonding. Bonding, Sunil K. S. A wise father knows his child. It's a very wise, intelligent child who takes time to know the father. <coughs> Cut I love churches. Philippos Master. For the most part of as the guests. Very good. Yeah. Let me take you back in time to my school days. I was an angry young man of 12, 13 years. I didn't like rules. I didn't like anything that I discipline. It was one of those challenging times for me within my family. I still remember I came home late one night. Knocked the door because my father opened the door for me. As I walked in, he caught me to the shoulders. Yo, you smell of cigarette, how dare you be smoking? The next thing I knew was a whack on my cheek. I mean, he was going, ring. I was stunned for a moment. But then I reacted. I reacted by shouting at him. That shouting ended up in a commotion. Such commotions got wider and wider with time. As any human being, my father reached the pinnacle of silent agony. And he proclaimed, yo, you're not going to get a penny from me, not anymore. You know to me the value of money. And I was the Mr. Fix in the neighborhood. I could fix everything. Teams, radios, electrical, plumbing, you name it. I started earning some money, but ended up spending every little penny on my friends. Called bad company. Boys loved me because I had money. Girls in the neighborhood thought, I was the bad boy. No marks for kissing. I didn't have girlfriends. Please raise your hands if you agree. Teenage and rebellion go together. See, so many hands up. Thank you. The moment I said teenage rebellion, there was an emotional response. Fear for those parents whose children are on the brink of adolescence. Despair and defense for those who are already struggling with teenage children. And a big sigh of relief for those parents whose children have already moved into adulthood. But there's just one side of the coin. Look at the other side, the children's side. Ask any teenager, many teenagers here. Parents, they are the parents. For them, parents are the epitome of misdeed and mistrust. Any teenager would say, parents just don't see our side. We have seen situations, we have gone through situations. The son or the child brings in a mark sheet, the progress card they call it the schools, and give it to the father. The father happily takes it. He just got a 90%. I used to get a 100% at school. Every father, 100%. You got the 90%? I used to get a hundred percent. Where is the ten percent? But dad, where is the ten percent? Shut up. But dad, shut up. Tell me why you lost the ten percent? Children. Children think we are intelligent enough to take decisions. Parents say no, we are the protectors, the guardians. We will decide for you. Both live in their own egocentric world pool. What does missing is the bonding? No, I'm not talking about it. Super the emotional attachment. For the parent gives unconditional love to the child. The child feels fully secure for the parent. That bonding was missing between me and my parents there. In spite of the troubles at my home, I managed to do some studies. Left my hometown in search of employment. Of course, carrying a spent of habit with me. Down the timeline, I got married. Lucky me. And further down the timeline, I was a proud father of myself to a son. 
That's where life is supposed to be. To struggle for more, to make the ends meet. The demand was growing crazy. I stopped to look back. I've been spending all my life. There has been no savings. A shop. My income was almost stagnant. My expense is growing. My responsibility is increasing. I was afraid. The fire of fear had caught me. I was depressed. It was in this depressed state of mind. Me, my wife, and my little baby. We went back home for a family reunion. I was about to take leave from my parents. And my father called me aside. Pat on my shoulder. Looked deep into my eyes. And said, my son, I see fear in your eyes. Don't be afraid. I am there for you. Saying that, he put a bunch of keys in my hand. I was stunned, lost for words. Emotions overtook me. Tears rolled on my eyes. I fell at his feet, literally washing his feet with tears. Everyone else thought I was seeking my father's blessings. But I'm sure my father knew his son was asking for his blessings, you know, forgiveness. The wise father had always known his child. It's me, the intelligent son, who took time to know the father. I stand here in front of you today, my friends, as a parent, as a son going home. As any parent here, I don't want my son to be me. I think as parents, we should take that first step forward to create that emotional attachment between the parent and the child. Let's open up. Let us parents talk to our children as friends, not build fear, but confidence. Let's not pressure our children to do what we want them to do or what we want them to become. Create the parent child bonding. Over to you, Philip and Cherry with a speech title Keep Walking. Keep Walking. Philip Cherry. Do you believe in destiny? I vividly recall my last day at school. The anxiety of the results weighed heavy. But there was a sense of relief also, like the day after the storm. Nevertheless, I decided to enjoy my well-earned holidays. But I did not. I was constantly reminded that if my results were not good, my destiny was at stake. Thankfully, I passed and my journey began. What does Jay? Dear friends, my joy was short lived when destiny was redefined. I was told, listen, actually, the next two years will decide your fate. There I was in college with renewed hopes and aspirations, but the lure of freedom was irresistible. Should I be confined to the lectures in the classroom? Or do I indulge in the pressures of the campus life and beyond? Unlike in school, there were no teachers for guidance. I was free. But with freedom came responsibility. The exams approached. And I had everyone breathing down my neck, reminding me of Destiny dangling on my results. I passed, but this time the results were not good enough to help me pursue an engineering career. An acceptable destiny during those days. I was disappointed, for I missed destiny by just 2%. 
Everyone tried to cheer me. And it was my grandmother who came to my rescue. She motivated me to go on. She narrated the story of a general who decided to attack his enemies, even when his army was hopelessly outnumbered. The general was confident of victory, but his men were filled with doubt. The general gathered his men and told them, I shall toss this coin. If it turns out to be heads, we will win. Let destiny reveal itself. The men watched anxiously as the general tossed the coin. The silence was broken when the general declared, It's heads! The men were filled with joy and confidence. They fought the war valiantly and crushed the enemies. As they were rejoicing, one of the soldiers asked, Is it not true that no one can change destiny? Very true, replied the general, and tossed the coin to the soldier, who was surprised to discover both sides of the coin had the same sign. Hence, my grandpa's message was like this double-headed coin. It instilled confidence in me. It taught me to believe in myself and seek new destiny relentlessly and diligently. The new destiny that grew large and friend was the information technology. I too quickly jumped into the bandwagon, expecting destiny to be beyond the clouds and crown me with glory. But my trust with destiny remained elusive. While pondering over my next plan, I came across an old classmate of mine who was academically challenged. But at the school reunion, he was brimming with confidence, bragging and flaunting his wealth and newly acquired lifestyle. I was impressed. He called me aside and told me very bluntly, Philip, you are wasting your time. Destiny is not here. I changed my focus towards the Middle East. In my pursuit of destiny, I embarked on a journey that took me for the first time across the borders and over the ocean. I landed an accounting job in Qatar. Meanwhile, I came to know my friends were all successful in the respective careers they chose. I was envious of their success. Here I was struggling to come across destiny. It was a frustrating period and I resorted to various means for solace. And on one such occasion, I came across these words. Keep walking. And it changed my outlook towards life. I remember these words whenever I come across disappointment or failure. Keep walking. Don't sit and brood over it. Today, when I look at the problems in my daily life, I realize the tension that I experienced on the last day at school was nothing. I am sure to come across bigger problems in life. I learned not to be bogged down by the problems of today. Keep walking with confidence. Steve Jobs, a man who has seen the ups and downs in life, said, quote, Again, you cannot connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. But trust that these dots will one day connect to your future. You need to believe in yourself. You need to trust in something. Call it karma, guts, destiny, whatever. This approach has never failed and has always helped me. Unquote. I am quite happy the way things have turned out in my life would be better. Setbacks are at times a blessing in disguise. We just need to learn to wriggle out of these situations and never to resign to fate. It is these experiences which make us wiser, stronger and tougher. Keep walking with 
determination. Dear Toastmasters and friends, destiny is not a destination. Believe in yourself. Keep walking towards your purpose in life. It is the twists and turns in life that make it interesting. We're taking a break from the International Speech Contest. The contestants will be called on stage after this enlightening session that we have in store for you. It is my honor to introduce this eminent personality who has served her country in Beijing, Hong Kong, The Hague, Geneva, Sweden and Latvia and is currently serving her country and countrymen in Qatar. She has also worked on the Pakistan desk as Under Secretary and Deputy Secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs. She has also contributed a great deal towards social issues such as human rights, climate change and disarmament and has worked with the International Labour Organization heading its international program for the elimination of child labour. A 1979 batch Indian Foreign Services Officer who holds the distinction of being the first woman ambassador to any Gulf state. As a member of the Indian expatriate community in Qatar and as an Indian woman, it is my great honor and privilege to invite on stage our keynote speaker for today, the Indian ambassador to Qatar, Her Excellency. Mrs. Deepa Gopalan Vadra. Mr. Khalid Alkut, District Governor, Mr. Alex Jeanette. Mr. Krishna Kumar, Mr. Yasir Nayanar, other dignitaries, particularly from Qatar, who are here. Ladies and gentlemen, Toastmasters, I must remember that, participants of the Toastmasters Annual Conference 2012. I must tell you something, when I came here, I thought I would be forced to speak without a text. So I have with me some little speaking notes. But then I heard the speakers before me and I absolutely dare not speak without a script. <laughs> because they were so absolutely, absolutely outstanding. A very, very good evening to all of you. Assalamu alaikum. Namaskar, as we say in India. When I came here at the end of a long evening, I thought, wrongly as I know, that you must be suffering from what I thought must be communication fatigue, because you started from the morning. But just as I heard speakers before us, I realized that I need not fear, because I think they kept you awake with, I think, just the power of their eloquence. I only fear that my subject today of this keynote address, which is communication powers change, will not, for me, become communication induced slumber as I speak after them. As members of the Toastmasters, you don't really need to be convinced about the subject. That's why you're here. You're really living examples of communication powers change and probably believe in it with far more conviction than a lot of us. So I'm not going to validate the subject, but I thought I would give you some interesting illustrations through his history through contemporary events and 
I should ask your forgiveness because being the ambassador of India, I will do my little duty by India and also give some examples, I think, predominantly from India, though I will also look outside, though I see that I am facing an international audience here. The one thing that we do know when we talk about communication empowering or powering change is that this is a truism which pervades every aspect of our lives, be it political, economic, societal or personal. But before I start, in fact, exploring these subjects, let me give you some communication jargon. And I quote, the theory of cognitive dissonance suggests that opinion change is a function of a specific complex interaction between the credibility of the communicator and the discrepancy of the communication from the initial attitude of the recipient. <laughs> I just read this and I thought, am I glad that the exams are behind me? And I'm sure you will agree with me too. In simple language, that really means that to power change, one must have an effective communicator. And you just saw that. Who knows the subject well, and that's what really struck me as they were speaking. The familiarity, the conviction, the subject that they were talking about. You must have a communication medium which is also credible as a message. And it should be packaged attractively. As far as the audience is concerned, or the target audience of ours, there should be a degree of receptivity or openness of mind. And I say this because if you're absolutely sure of your belief, whatever I say, that will change you. Hence, back to our subject of communication powers change. It is only if all these ingredients are here that we will be able to change the beliefs, behavioral patterns, or indeed in cases, entire systems of operation, be they political, economic, or corporate. Let me give you a simple example of what I said. Just think back of our four, four, four fathers, the mighty caveman. Think of a situation. He likes a woman, but she doesn't want to be confined to this dark cave, cleaning and cooking carcasses for him. She wants to wander free, as I'm sure a lot of women here do. But the caveman, he uses his best known instrument of communication, which is his big heavy club, delivers the message, which is a quack on her head, grabs her by the hair, and drags her to the cave. He is thus effectively able to use his best known communication instrument to bring about a change in both her belief and her behavior. Yes, perhaps the communication was not too verbal, it was non-verbal. But then that was before the Toastmasters were born. <laughs> Is that a good example? I think not. Because when we say communication powers change, there has to be some positivity about it. There has to be a positive ring about it. The change has to be directed towards improving the quality of life. And while some great thinkers were easily identifiable, and perhaps some governments of the day believed that power came from the barrel of a gun, we know that from the best classroom of, of life, which is history, that that sort of change which came through force and coercion was never sustainable. 
most mighty and much more mighty than the sword was the idea. And if this was communicated effectively, it could and has changed the world. When we think of communication bringing about change, the first category, very obviously, that comes to our mind, particularly in the environment that we live, is changes of political systems. And to understand that, I thought, what better example than that of India, the country that I myself know best? We are an example of a country which won independence from colonial rule through the power of an idea, satyagraha, non-violent protests, spread through one of the greatest communicators in history, Mahatma Gandhi, who inspired the likes of Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela and many others to this day. In fact, I think President Obama too and several others. How many of you know that long before Mohan Das Karanchan Gandhi became the Mahatma of India as we know it, he was a lawyer journalist in South Africa who fearlessly edited a publication called Indian Opinion. He brought it out in English, Tamil and Gujarati, which are the most common languages. And through this was able to campaign and rally opinion and bring about a change in the repressive laws of South Africa vis-a-vis -vis the Indians. Once he was in India, he, he had a message to spread, but he spread it not only through his ideas, but also through his personal travel. He traveled to every nook and corner of India with his message, reached out to the people. Very often, I think, had there been electronic communication in that day, was, were there internet, Twitter, Facebook, would we have got independence earlier than we did? Would the struggle have been less difficult? Because it was easier to spread the message around. Communication has become much easier now. And would it have been easier for India, as it has been recently, in the course of the Arab Spring. Because as you know during the Arab Spring, the power of instant messaging and the internet has been a very, very effective tool in the hands of those who sought to change their governments. The next category of, of, of uh, where communication has power change is in the economic realm. And here, whether it was Adam Smith or Marx, we know that through their ideas, they were able to revolutionize the way people thought of economics. Not only thoughts, practices and systems, but in fact, political systems as well. The present wave of globalization through which we are all passing and which we are living, which has made this vast, vast geography of the world into one little village, is really being powered through communication and has changed the world forever. But when we speak of communication, power and change, I think most commonly the best examples are from the field of societal changes in society. I don't know how many of you have heard of this story. I didn't really till I was trying to research what I was going to tell you today. And I came across this transformational story of a program on All India Radio. Now those who know India will tell you that All India Radio is almost one of the most boring sort of stations nobody listens to any longer. But All India Radio in the 90s had a program which falls in the realm of really infotainment or edutainment I think it's called. It was a soap opera on the radio, mind you, and it was called Tinka Tinka Sukh, which means little steps to a bit better life. What happened was that this used to be broadcast, and then one day, All India Radio, director of All India Radio, received a letter signed by a person called Kushwaha, who said he was a tailor. 
It was written by him, authored by him, and signed by another 184 people. And the story was how this program had entirely changed the village in which they lived, which was a relatively unknown village in UP called Lutsan, which I don't think any one of us has heard about. And there were a series of postcards that came about how people listened to this program and how they had made so many changes in the villages. So there were some sociologists who were curious enough to visit the village and find out what had happened and how it had happened. And what they found was this tailor used to have this little tailoring shed in the middle of the village. And he used to have a, a radio. And as people wandered by, they would stop by him and there would be this program and he would talk about it and it became extremely popular. Then he had a friend who was the postmaster of the village, a gentleman called Sharma. They decided that every time they heard a program, they would write a few comments about it, first of all in their radio. The other thing they did was they set up small clubs. This is really a small village. And they would discuss the issues that had come through the soap opera. And this was real life people there. They talked about a woman who had been thrown out of her house because she didn't get enough of dowry. There was a suffering of a woman who got married, ill treated by her husband, not educated enough to have a life of her own, and so on. And do you know what happened at the end of it was there was such social and political consciousness in this, pe in this people in this village that apparently the entire village changed. One of the things was that people who know India will know that they stopped accepting dowry. That they made sure there was 100% immunization in the village. And I think the best part of, of the story which I like is that before this, the ratio of boys to girls in this little school they had, which was up to the 8th standard, was 90 is to 10, that is 90 boys to 10 girls. In one year, it changed 60 to 40. And I think this is really one of the best examples that I had read about how communication had power change in a small, remote, dusty village of India. There are several such examples, I think, in different parts of the world. I was also reading about some of them in Latin America and in Africa. In South Africa, I understand there was a program called Soul City, which addressed the problem of HIV AIDS. And as you know, it is just through sheer advocacy that in many parts of the world, in fact, today, we haven't got rid of HIV AIDS, but certainly, I think the numbers, the rate of growth has plateaued. And this really is due to the power of communication. It's been through radio programs, television programs, civil society, and reaching out to people to change their behavior and as to what to do in case, unfortunately, they, have, they are afflicted by the disease. Most recently, it happened last Sunday, I think, we, there was a TV program in India by a very famous uh, and popular actor of ours, Indians will know, called Amir Khan. It was called Satya Mev Jayate. I don't know how many of you saw it. Okay, unfortunately I didn't, but I've heard so much about it. Apparently this is this famous actor who went out, who's been fanned out across India. And he has met people and talked about their problems, you know, with, I mean the most simple, ordinary people. And he has brought this to this TV show. He's a very, very powerful actor. But he's brought this to this TV show. And I'll tell you what has been uh, the, the, the effect of the first program that he's done is, that, which was about female feticide. As you know, people in India very often prefer uh, male children. And therefore, sometimes you have this female feticide when actually they, you know, probably abort the child, they know it's a girl and so on. So, um, this problem of female feticide that we brought to this TV, the, the chief minister of the state, uh, one of our very important states called Rajasthan, met him and decided to take action, as had been advocated by the various uh, the social activists there, and had been ignored by the government, till this was brought to the television by this actor. So, again, the power of communication 
which was able to bring about change. The medium of communication has changed over time. When you look back into time, you have oral traditions. I think each of the great religions of the world really spread through these oral traditions. It was by memory and by root. And then later, you have the written word. <coughs> After the written word, of course, while the written word is there, you also have spread through fables and parables. But also, I think, you have uh, you know, better means of, communi of, of, of communication of the written word. And this became a very important medium, as you know, in Europe. In the 19th century, you have the discovery of the telegraph, which was again going to be a revolution. And then, in the 20th century, where most of us, I think, were born, the explosion of the electronic media, now the internet, and I think the most recent, or in the last few years, the phenomenon of instant messaging, which we know has had a great impact on the world. Who then can question that communication has become the most powerful instrument for change? The only thing I think as Toastmasters and people who understand the power of communication, there is just one word of caution that while the various forms of media of communication permits us, allows us to disseminate our message effectively, we have to be sure that the message, the medium, and the audience we reach out to all in some way bring about an improvement in the quality of life and improvement in the world. Thank you very much. from history. Now may I request our division governor, Toastmaster Krishna Kumar, to hand out a memento as a token of our appreciation. Thank you, Your Excellency. Now, it's time to get back on track with our international speech contest. May I invite the international contest chair, Toastmaster Koka Prasad, to go ahead with the proceedings. I would like to call upon the contestants. Are you still here? Just outside the room. 
from the prizes courtesy of support sponsor Consolidated Golf Company. And the second announcement, if you want the DVD of today's event, register with Toastmaster Sham Sundar or just contact him. It costs only 30 riyals, but it's priceless in terms of education and entertainment. Moving on. Life is like a mirror. We get the best results when we smile at it. So remember contestants for evaluation, table topic, all the contestants for international speech contest and numerous contest. Do smile, to continue smiling till the end of the results. You never know. So does that mean we can also smile and go back to our seats now? Mm-hmm. Picture of the Barbie and Mary Go. You think there's more? <laughs> but the contrasts are over. <coughs> yes, Roxana, the contrasts are over, but it's time for us to wind up. It's time to change. It's time to join the audience. And it's also time to introduce our next set of MCs. Who will make this change even better? We Toastmasters convey ourselves through verbal communication. Have you ever thought of conveying your feelings through dance? We have a friendly personality amongst us who knows how to balance between the two. And she expresses herself in the most graceful way. An exponent in her classroom, she runs her own dance academy and still finds time to dedicate herself to Toast Pastors. Here comes one of the MCs for the rest of the evening who is smart, elegant, confident, and a versatile personality. Toast Master, Shweta. from Qtel Toastmasters. He's named after a saint, Saint Cyril, but he confesses he's no saint. His weakness is small, fast cars. Sadly, he doesn't drive his green Ferrari. He drives the poor man's Ferrari, a red Mini Cooper S. This Toastmaster has won many contests at club, area and division level, including last year's division evaluation contest. A senior sales manager at QTEL for the past seven years, he believes there is no challenge more challenging than the challenge to improve yourself. Well, today, he's taken on a new and daring challenge. He's the first male MC of the day, and he's also the last. So let's hear it for the man Famous for his clean shaven looks. Up here, that is. Advanced Communicator Bronze, Toastmaster Cyril Anand. Thank you, Roxana and Sunny. That's one of the best intros that I've had of late. <laughs> Cute those masters, are you listening? Great. You'll need to improve on your introductions. 
As we set up the stage for the last round, the last sessions for the day, we have a few things that we need to set up before we do. Can I ask Toastmaster Sakib to bring up the disclaimer? This is for the personal security of Shweta and myself. We need to first take you all through the disclaimer. Shweta. Before I begin, before I begin, I have to say, what a wonderful stage, brilliant atmosphere, and lovely audience. Give yourselves a big hand. You're looking great today. Fantastic. Well done. You know, I stood up here for the first time when I was introducing the ambassador, and I saw everything was so bright and shiny. And then I realized, no wait, that's just Sidhu's head. <laughs> But the disclaimer, very important, it's almost like an insurance policy for us. So we will explain. Or not. I'm going to read it out to you in case any of it doesn't make sense. All characters appearing in this work are non-fictitious and are absolutely real. All resemblances to people living, not dead, are not coincidental and are completely, utterly, and totally intentional. A special award, as you can see, is that too small? A special award will be presented to anyone who can identify the characters correctly. Ten points extra if you know what club they belong to. <laughs> so, long live the Toastmasters. Say, Lila, we ready. Just a few more minutes. <laughs> Toastmaster Yasser's laptop, which is as slow as his name. But we'll be there in a minute. Perhaps you need to elaborate a bit more on the award. What type of an award is that going to be? This one? Yeah, a special award? Oh yeah, a special award that would allow that person to speak freely in front of an audience without worrying about dignitaries in France, saying the names correctly, hierarchy, so on and so forth. What would you give them? I would give them a brick bat. A brick bat? Anyway, we are almost there and I should be able to set the ball rolling now. Ladies and gentlemen, we are also waiting for our guest of honor who has excused himself for a prayer and he will be back. So we will be introducing the dignity in a few moments. So we will be waiting for him. But, this gentleman, yes, I am specifying, he's a gentleman. Every time he hosts something, he ensures that the entire audience cheers for his weight loss. Once 
set of people who the one set of people and good pastors who never cease to surprise me year after year. Who's that? <laughs> yes. That is so true. You can say out loud, please. The judges. No, that came from someone who had testing, so he's now in his face now. <laughs> but we also test if there's never been anything I was mastering. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I think we can get going with the uh, uh, international directors. I think so. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know what is or are the two most used excuses that people give or Toastmasters give when they don't come to meetings? Five million permission. I want to go up. The why the why is not giving permission is the real reason. The excuse that they give is I had a meeting, yes. Or 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 I'm so busy at work that I cannot manage or put in the time and effort for something else. Which makes me think the next course master that we're going to call on stage has the easiest job in Uber. Being the head of finance, the financial department in Tech, was a very easy job. I mean, he had the time to contest for the national letter and he got it. I don't think he's a real Toastmaster. <laughs> you don't think he's a real Toastmaster? Send an email to any Toastmaster in this room and people can vouch if you have done this to Toastmaster Sake that he'll send a three and a half page introduction and expect you to read the entire three and a half. <laughs> But when we did the same to our international director, he sent back one sentence. Introduce me as you know me. That's exactly what I should. A postmaster who takes the art of public speaking a little bit serious, I'm joking. Seriously. A gentleman, a dignified gentleman who thinks before he speaks. Someone who still believes that practice makes anyone perfect, a well-known member of the community and a well-loved member of the community. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome on stage the International Director of Toastmasters, Vivian George Trump. District Governor DTM Khairidhar Khud, Jaffan Governor Education and Training Alex Hennett, Division E Governor KK Krishna Kumar, past Regional Advisors Sunny Burgis, dignitaries, fellows, masters, guests, and friends. Good evening. <coughs> the founder of our Toastmasters Movement. Ras Medley said, you learn best when you enjoy what you do. I'm sure all of you are passionate as well as enjoying the whole day's proceedings to be here. So full of energy, so full of enthusiasm. But how can we love everything what we do in life? Because we have our lives and our dislikes. We can choose certain things, we cannot choose certain things in life. So how can we be happy about things for which we have no control? A friend of mine told me about the prayer which they used to pray in their school in Gujarat, in Gujarat. But if it's translated into English, it will sound something like this. God, give me the strength to change the things that I can change in this world. God, give me the courage to accept the things that I cannot change in this world. God, give me the wisdom to distinguish between the two. So if you cannot change something, accept it. If you can change something, 
changed and you will enjoy your life. Henry Ford said, if you enjoy what you are doing, you need not work even for a single day in your life. So you need to enjoy what you do, whether you work at home, in Toastmasters, in the society, wherever it is. And life can be enjoyable every moment when you live in this world. And we can truly contribute to the betterment of mankind. Toastmasters is all about finding the courage to change. And realizing your full potential and helping others to realize theirs and if you do that and if you really enjoy doing it you can have one of the best life in this world and can contribute truly towards mankind over to Sweta and Sir. Yes, coming together from 
you know, collecting different culture. What being one lesson, how we should take our life in the future with peace and understanding and respect. And I think probably if we could have work better and better, we will see a lot of friendship and a lot of cooperation. And we can probably utilize the communication, the technology of the communication to the best of development and integrated understanding of peace. I don't know what to say more about that, but I wish you the best and I hope in the future we will see, you know, I would, would like to welcome all of you in the city of Qatar. You are here in your country anyway and you are, we acknowledge your contribution to the Nobody can, you know, ignore that. And uh, no more than that probably. Thank you very much. And I Everybody is talking about change. 
And what drives the businesses? They want to talk about change. They want to, to basically say profitability. They are spending so many times, so many hours of their employees to just to get their profitability, to stay in their businesses. And of course, we are with our business as dedicated employees and we will achieve their goals and targets. And then we work for them. So I think I can accept this stage. Power, of course, as all you know, it can be in many forms. It can be an energy, it can be your fuel, it can be your food, it can be your emotions. Of course, when we speak about love, we speak about emotion, and this is probably the greatest power that you can have. And of course, communication. So what is communication? <coughs> Sometimes I wonder, is really communication that important? Communication part of leadership or the leadership part of that communication? What makes communicator? Is the leadership skills or the communication skills that make you part of the leaders? I know there are so many questions I just asked you. I hope you can answer these questions later on tonight or maybe in a few days. But definitely communication is the power to change. Communication, 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 and code. Communication is most important, most ignored. It's ignored in the house between husband and wife. And after so many years, he still says, I told you so. And she said, no, you did not say that. It's unbelievable. I spent almost between 12 to 16 hours with my wife for 24 years. I still cannot communicate to her. <laughs> so I'm, I don't know what I'm doing here given this speech about communication. <laughs>
care about the creation of jobs. So communication is very, 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 very important. I will say in my book, it's the foundation of all leadership. If you cannot communicate, you just cannot make drive people forward. Well, well, in this life, you just cannot have to go and read the whole book. Well, somebody else with you can give you the whole thing about life that you can understand after a few, a few years. So, very impressive speech by Your Excellence. Very, uh, very short and sweet and welcome to Dr. Ali's speech. I really don't know what, uh, what, uh, what to say more, except there is so much energy, there is so much talent here that you will definitely rise. Thank you very much. Uh, oops, I forgot my secret. Does anybody can guess? Thank you. It's really my secret to come in here. Is one, one thing and only one thing. And it's, I hope I can inspire you as much as you inspire me. Because every year I come, you inspire me.
the leaflet and drop into the boxes which have been placed at the entrance. I know if there are 10 fantastic phones that are going to be up for grabs. How many of you have put in your details? How many of you consider yourself lucky today? Come on, a little bit higher. Have some fun. Oh, two hands. Very good. Well done, well done. We'd like to thank. And last but not the least, may I invite DTM Sunny Burgess to share with us a few thoughts on this event. DTM Sunny Burgess. National Director George Thomas, District Governor Khalid, LD Alex, Division Governor KK, my dear friends. The great Greek philosopher Herodotus said, There is nothing is constant in life except when it gets change. Probably he may have heard of his Toastmasters at that time. I have heard so many people talking about change. We have changed successfully. But I remember those words. It takes me to 16 years back, 1996, when we started the first Toastmaster Club in Lilua World, Ramada. There were 14 members, the founder members. And now, there are only two members remaining from the 20 members as Trust Masters. These two members felt that there is a lot to gain and a lot to learn. When we went for the first GT meeting, it was not DTA, they used to call Gulf Territorial Council meeting in Bahrain. Including the high Trust Masters, there were only eight clubs in the whole Middle East. At that time when they spoke, wow, how could people speak like this? Many people changed the letter, many. But these two guys remained as those masters. They became their presidents, they became area governors, they became regional governors, they became district governors, and they became international officers. And they are only two people from international officers of this country. There is a lot. Change is happening. <coughs> Success comes to every one of us. If you think that success came to you by default or by coincidence, certainly not. It is the result of hard work and conscious effort to succeed. If something happens accidentally, it will not remain forever. Today was the day of competition. Those masters manifested their skill as speakers. Always contest to win. Today's meaning of winning is not only the trophy. Winning is performing better than before. If all the contestants could feel themselves that they have performed better than before, they were all winners. They came to this stage because they were all winners, first of all, at different levels. Ladies and gentlemen, as Toastmasters, a lot more for every one of us to grow and miles to go. Over to you, sir.
You have put it in, you haven't, huh? Those of you who haven't, it's too late. I'll come to the object box quickly, but for that, we have two uh, distinguished Toastmasters who have attended the stage at this year. Toastmaster Mansur Moidi, are you here? Yes, great. Can you have your stage? And Toastmaster Arjun. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Toastmaster Madhu Moiti Bhai.
Thank you, Mr. Saramish. I am here to express the gratitude from the division, ESCOM, and from the Council. Any event of this magnitude is not possible without the collective efforts of a team. Today, we stand here because all of you have worked for an entire year to come here and to demonstrate your best that you have gained from those masters. Some did wonderfully and some did but what matters is that we all try and we will keep trying. A huge round of applause for all the Toastmaster members present here for making this team of work to our end. We have expressed our all Javadiers and youngsters, the future Javadiers, who have been working since morning at the registration counter tirelessly. Can we have a round of applause? Thank you. 
Toastmaster, James Thomas. like to uh, 
uh, be in person in the past, future or the present event. But I am sure the winner of this contest must be very, very fortunate to be here in the present.